Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to another uh, daily movie review. Today, we're going to be checking out the 1975 classic, The Man Who Would Be King. It is directed by John Huston, written by John Huston, and Gladys Hill, adapted from a Rudy Kipling story of the same name. It stars Sean Connery, Michael Caine, Christopher Plummer, Saeed Jaffrey, Albert Moses, and others. The logline plot synopsis on IMDb says two British former soldiers decide to set themselves up as kings in Kafiristan, a land where no white man has set foot since Alexander the Great. So I've been watching some Connery movies. You know, last week, Zoobox goes to the movies. I kind of just did, you know, a solo remembrance of Connery and talked about some of his roles and kind of how he was involved in my young entertainment life, right? And, oh, I guess to this day. And I just wanted to watch something really good. I was like, you know, let's go for a classic. And I had seen The Man Who Would Be King maybe like, I don't know, when I was like 12. Long, long, long time ago. I probably watched it on cable at some point. You know, it's funny. I had actually knew the story before I ever saw the movie. It's like one of these things you, you would pick up through cult, cultural osmosis, right? This idea that like just it's out there the scenes are out there like they're on best of lists and uh like the amc used to always have like series like the hundred scariest moments the hundred greatest scenes in movie history and i used to watch those whenever they were on and the ending of the man who would be king the final scene is always makes the cut it's always there well one of the final scenes i guess the the penultimate scene is usually there with uh sean connery walking on a rope bridge Spoilers. Anyways, so this kind of felt like a fresh watch, though. I, uh, like I said, I hadn't had it done in a long time. Um, I wish I kind of wanted to read the short story before I talked about it, but I don't think I'm going to have time. But I am actually going to. There's an audiobook version on YouTube. I'm going to go jump in and, uh, and listen to it. But from what I understand, it's a pretty faithful adaptation. And this is something that John Huston was trying to get into production forever like for 25 30 years it was kind of just a story he read as a boy um he was you know kind of taken with it he always wanted to adapt it it's interesting because i mentioned and i talked about a few months ago the treasure of the sierra madra which is another john houston movie one of his earlier flicks and uh it has a lot of parallels to the man who would be king and it would actually would make a fantastic fantastic double feature uh but he had been trying to make get this made forever because i mean there was even on a point where i believe he had clark gable and Cary grant cast as the leads and then after that he had um he wanted to do paul newman and robert redford and it was actually robert redford that was like listen we're not really right for this uh you, you should pick you should get some british guys uh or at least british adjacent guys because sean connery obviously kind of sort of british but he's really he's scottish right from edinburgh but him and Michael Caine end up getting cast after all this time, and then they go into production pretty quickly. It all actually comes together pretty quickly um, after being stalled, like, in the 50s. Because that's how long, you know, Houston was trying to get it made. And the rest is history, right? Uh, it is a fantastic kind of a character study slash adventure movie. It also kind of has, like, deep, deep layers, though. Uh, Kipling... For whatever people feel about Kipling, if you read his stories or if you've seen movies like, you know, The Jungle Book or whatever, there's a lot of interesting subtext that he builds into them. And he's a he's and he was worked as a journalist, too. So there's a sense of like kind of reporting on the world around him and the kinds of things that were going on. So, you know, this takes place at a time where, you know, British soldiers in India and they're at, and they're at war over there where they're basically colonizing. They're colonizers in the, in the real way, not in a way that like people kind of just broadly throw that shit around. So that kind of stuff is actually built into the subtext of the movie and the characters. Um, because these guys are basically con men. They're not great dudes. <laughs> I mean, they're like, they're funny and they're affable, but they're sleazy. And they kind of fuck off from the war and they're just like, let's go find our fortune. Let's go become rich men somewhere. Um, it's a little different in the movie, I think, than in the book, from what I understand, is that like in the movie, it is more kind of straightforward, like, we're there to find treasure. We're, we're treasure hunters. We, we've kind of gone the globe and we've busted out a few times or this part of the world and we've busted out in the Middle East. So there's this part of Afghanistan, uh, Kafiristan, that is has not really been visited by the white man since Alexander the Great. So they assume 
Maybe there's something there. Maybe we should go check it out. And then we can kind of take our, and because these people are savages, they're mountain people, we'll be able to take, you know, some guns and uh, kind of be seen as gods, ma magicians, uh, having, they'll just be overpower the kind of the culture, basically. And that's kind of what the movie for a long period of time, it kind of goes into this notion of them kind of reappropriating uh, the, the ignorance of these, these cultures and use it, utilizing kind of what they know, the kind of men that they are. They're actually kind of brutal guys. They lack empathy. They don't really, they, they're, they're selfish, they're narcissistic. And how that affects the kind of the culture around them that they're, that they're coming to kind of take over. And as the story goes, you know, you, you realize that uh, they find a way where basically they can kind of position themselves as kind of gods and, you know, it ends up kind of getting away with itself. Uh, they just don't know when to stop. So it's a story of kind of greed and the failures of greed, the fault of greed. That's why I said if you've ever seen the film The Treasure of the Sierra Madra, it would make a really great uh double feature i would say there's even moments at the end of the movie that are very almost direct parallels to the treasure of the sierra madre which i thought was fascinating because you know houston had read this book when he was or the short story when he was a kid and had always wanted to adapt it i was like i was like oh maybe he kind of like threw some stuff in there you know from this story into the treasure of the sierra madre because there's so much of it that kind of felt resonant you know um but in the movie and in the book, though, the book is more overtly kind of a morality tale that is specific to Freemasonry. Uh, Rudyard Kipling was a Freemason, and this is the book. Uh, the characters are Masons. They're, they're Masons in the movie. And it's there. It's definitely there in the movie. Uh, they do all this stuff where they use the kind of the secret words. If you don't know, the Freemasons are kind of like this evolution of like the Knights Templar and a few other kind of secret societies. It's often sold as kind of like a gentleman's club. You know, you've probably seen the Masons out there. They do, you know, public public works. It's kind of like, a, what do you call it? For Catholics, they have a, an organization that's very much like the, the Knights of something or other. Can't remember. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank right now. But anyways. But, uh, but, they're, but they have kind of a cultish roots. Honestly, they do. And uh, what's in the book and, and in the movie, in the movie it's just not... Over, as overt about it because they're talking in these kind of code words occasionally um there's this kind of code of ethics that ma masons have between each other that you don't basically fuck over other masons and there's this interesting thing in the um in the movie where you find out that basically at some point in the past masons had been there and the people that were left behind um they kind of developed their own religion around some of the Masonic symbolism and some of the uh, traditions. So they're kind of aware of some of these things. So when these dudes come in and you find out like, Oh shit, we can take advantage of this because we can assign and project the meanings, but they're breaking the rules. They're breaking their oath as Masons because whether or not these people really understand everything, there's a sense that uh, this is a betrayal. This would be betraying your fellow Masons. So the movie ends, spoiler alert, with, you know, uh, Sean Connery dying uh, after he kind of just, you know, he gets a little out of hand. He starts <laughs> demanding people call him a god, and he gets exposed as a fraud, basically. And uh, they make him walk out on a rope bridge, and they cut the rope bridge while he's out there. It's a pretty intense scene. It's a great scene, though. Fantastically performed. Uh, so it's really kind of more about that. It's about, like, you know a Mason, a basic kind of Mason morality play where it's just like, don't, don't be an asshole to other Freemasons. The movie sets it up nicely. Cause they have Rudyard Kipling is actually a character in the story. Um, cause he's a, he was a journalist and he shows up. Christopher P Plummer plays him. And, uh, that's the first interaction is between Rudyard Kipling and Michael Caine's character, peachy. And, uh, Michael Caine basically lifts his watch only to discover that, Oh shit, he's a Mason. I have to give this back. <laughs> So he actually has to like kind of follow him and give him back his watch. Um, so it kind of sets up this dynamic that they know about that. So when they go to Kafiristan or Kafiristan, or the hell, however the hell you pronounce it, it's uh, and they they kind of understand, start to understand what is going on. Uh, they they go against their own code basically, and then they get their comeuppance.
you know? Um, there's, like I said, there's other layers. Uh, Kipling had kind of an interesting, from what I did a little bit of research, you know, just because I, when I watch a movie, I sometimes I just look up trivia and look up all the sorts of shit. And Kipling had an interesting view of things like colonizing and whatnot. He has like a poem, I believe, called uh, The White Man's Burden, which would probably be considered, uh, it's a racist term or used, often used to talk about these ideas in maybe in a racist way. But Kipling didn't take the tact. Like, uh, he just looked at it from the, the position of a colonizer. And when you go into a territory and you go to take it over, it becomes your burden because then you become culturally responsible for it. You know, it's your problem. Their problems are now your problems. You've taken over this territory. You were trying to colonize it. They become your wards to a certain degree. And that's culturally, they look at it. He looked at it as that would be, a, that's a burden. That's kind of why he wasn't like so into it, I guess. Maybe that's kind of what made him a little bit more like anti-war, anti-colonizer to a certain degree. Uh, was because he just didn't think the juice was worth the squeeze all the time. So he's, he's an interesting uh, figure. Actually, I would really like to delve more into Ruder Kipling. He's kind of a blind spot, like, in my kind of literary knowledge. Like, I think I read The Jungle Book. Maybe A Tale of Two Cities. I like it, but it would have been so long ago that I can't really tangibly remember m most, of, most of it. I've heard a few of his poems over the past couple of years. Like I said, the white man's burden thing. You can go look up on YouTube. Most of his stuff on YouTube, there's audiobooks, if you are so inclined. You know, I like to do just kind of my daily shit. I'll just have it on in my phone in my pocket, and I'll just listen to it while I'm just doing whatever, cleaning the house or doing whatever. Playing outside, me and uh, my kids playing outside. We listen to audiobooks. We listen to podcasts. We're, real, we're cool guys. We're really cool guys. Anyways, uh, just some of the technical stuff, though. It's a beautifully shot movie. It's beautifully scored. The the performances are great uh, apparently at the time uh michael kane got kind of shit on by the critics because the movie has like a light touch to it where it actually has kind of a sense of fun and adventure and um it kind of embraces the absurdity of what's going on at times before it kind of takes this darker turn the, the darkness is mostly in the subtext until the end of the movie so it has kind of this fun light air to it a lot of the time uh, shot by Oswald Morris, who, let's see what else he did. He did Sleuth, another uh, Citizen Kane movie. Or not <laughs> Citizen Kane, another Michael Kane movie. Oliver, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. He shot The Dark Crystal. Oh, The Great Muppet Caper. I must have been working with The Oz. What's his name? Or Henson. The Oz. <laughs> Equus. Yeah, he's done some stuff. Um, done some cool shit. Sleuth is a great movie, by the way. Just throwing it out there. I really like Sleuth. Yeah, I even like the remake. Uh, yeah, but he shot the Dark Crystal. Now it's not like maybe on the it's not on the level of like uh, something say like Lawrence of Arabia with his beautiful landscape shots and whatnot. But it's it's nice. It, I thought it was it's got a really nice, unique, distinct look to it. Um, yeah. I mean, this is the kind of a movie that would be awesome to talk to a person with. Uh, and really kind of just break it all down and do all the research, listen to the audiobook and come back. So maybe someday in the near future, in the future, we'll do that. Uh, it would actually be great to do like a double feature. Zubox goes to the movies with this and the treasure of the Sierra Madra uh, with somebody who's maybe not super familiar with either. It would probably be interesting. So good movie. Good job, Mr. Houston. I think you nailed it, buddy. This is one I don't actually own. I got to I got to. I'm going to have to get a physical copy of The Man Who Would Be King at some point. Stop fucking around. Got to get serious with this shit. You know what I'm saying? Nah, I mean... Yeah. But you should watch it. You should check it out. It's a great movie. It's not really streaming anywhere right now. You actually have, have to rent it. Sorry about that. Or, you know, maybe you find it somewhere else. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Check out The Man Who Would Be King. I think you're going to enjoy it. I think you'd really enjoy it. I was surprised like how engrossing it was. It was just like immediately I was like, wow, this is really fucking good. Like from the get-go. It's a little, it felt a little muddled, a little messy in the beginning because I was not familiar with the source material. I never, you know, read the book. So I was not, I was kind of confused as to what was going on for like the first 15 minutes. But once 
the story kind of gets in earnest and then you have like the hindsight of what was happening in the beginning, it starts to make more sense. Um, I would like to dive into more of the kind of explicitly the Freemason stuff. I It's probably more in the movie than I realize that it is. Like I said, yeah, kind of, I knew I had heard about this, that a long time ago, like there being like the theories about the Freemasonry a- angle to it, but it kind of just got stuck back in my subconscious and when I was watching it, it kind of came back up and I was like, oh, I should look into that. I only really had time to kind of do like five minute, ten minute like thing just a few minutes ago. I was like, oh, I should go look to see what's going on with that. But uh, yeah, I'd like to like this. Like I said, this would be a cool one to talk to somebody about uh, with about be good. Be awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to know more about ZooBox, a bunch of links in the description. If you'd like to make a recommendation for one of these daily videos or for something for Zoobox Goes to the Movies or even a topic to talk about on the regular show on Zoobox Prime, you uh, leave it in the comments and we'll, we'll put it on the list. All right, everybody. Goodbye.